Thank you, Rebecca. Welcome everyone to the first virtual online take action group for veterans with seizures. Thank you so much for joining us today. As Rebecca mentioned, my name is Natalia and I'm the nurse coordinator for the Epilepsy Center at the West LAVA. Today's talk, which is going to be one of six or seven, will focus on providing you with an overview of seizures and epilepsy and the VA services available. The next sessions will focus more on delving into those topics, so I hope that you'll be able to join for the future talks as well. Okay, next slide. The overview for today, in the next 20 minutes, I hope to go over what are the VA Epilepsy Centers of Excellence and what kind of services are provided by the ECOE, what is a seizure, what is epilepsy, what are the causes for seizures and what kinds of seizures there are, the seizure triggers, how is epilepsy diagnosed, and what kind of treatments are available for the seizures, and the resources available to veterans with seizures. And as you can imagine, it's a lot of information to cover, but I do wish to briefly present to you the concepts and services, and each patient is unique, and the considerations need to be tailored accordingly, so I do urge you to consider what applies to you and discuss with your neurology providers or reach out to our centers for more information. So the VA Epilepsy Centers of Excellence were established in 2008 by the Department of Veteran Affairs under the public law, and they created 16 sites that are linked to form four regional centers with a mission statement of improving health and well-being of veteran patients with epilepsy and other seizure disorders through the integration of clinical care outreach, research, and education. The services provided include specialty epilepsy clinics or seizure clinics, expert pharmacological treatment, inpatient video EEG monitoring, also called the EMU or the Epilepsy Monitoring Unit, advanced diagnostic studies, surgical interventions, and in some centers, telemedicine. Next slide, thank you. The regional map of the ECOEs is here for you to refer back to, and as you can see, they're starred by the 16 sites and the color coded by the regional areas. And then the next slide. So this has the locations and contact numbers as well as the website that has a lot more information if you want to look into it. But these, um, this slide provides you with the VA center, the address, and the phone numbers for the epilepsy centers if you have more questions if you're from a different area. Okay, next slide. I just wanted to share with you some of the statistics and there are 65 million people who have epilepsy worldwide. Over 2 million Americans have the diagnosis. There are 150,000 new cases in the U.S. annually. One in 10 people have had a seizure in their lifetime and approximately one in 26 people in the U.S. will develop epilepsy in their lifetime. And it's a very common uh, brain disorder and very serious and as the World Health Organization states has no age, racial, social, national, or geographic boundaries. So it can happen to anybody who has a brain. Next slide. And as you can imagine, having one in ten, one in ten people having had a seizure, it doesn't necessarily mean that all those people have the diagnosis of epilepsy. And the difference is that a seizure is a sign, it's a symptom, it's an event, and it refers to an abnormal, abnormal electrical discharge in the brain. So your brain is constantly working by sending electrical discharges, and a seizure is just an abnormal electrical discharge. And the characteristics of how your seizure looks like depends on the location of those discharges. And like I mentioned, having a seizure doesn't necessarily mean you have epilepsy, but when you have epilepsy, you have recurrent seizures that are spontaneous. And typically, the diagnosis of epilepsy would come if you have two or more unprovoked seizures that are separated by 24 hours. And by unprovoked meaning you didn't have a very low blood sugar or you didn't have a very high fever that provoked the seizure to occur. Next slide. So this is also for you to refer to later. It's just a diagram of the anatomy and the functional areas of the brain. And for an example, although these are rare, but if you do have seizures that are from your occipital lobe, and that's uh, marked by number one, that's your visual center, 
And so, for instance, if your seizure started in the occipital lobe, you may have some visual disturbances. Next slide. Here is also a picture representation of the two major types of seizures. Uh, there are uh, many kinds of seizures and each can present differently. So you can have strange sensations or even emotions and behaviors, different movements by different parts of your body. But typically they do divide as two major types of seizures and it refers to where the seizure starts. So one type is the generalized seizure and that means that the seizure is starting on both sides of your brain, so your whole brain is seizing at the onset. And focal or partial refers to uh, usually one side of the brain in a specific area. That's where the seizure would start, but it could always progress to become a generalized seizure and spread to both sides of the brain. Okay. So what are some causes of epilepsy? About 60 to 70 percent of people with epilepsy have an unknown cause, but the main, um, the major top four are traumatic brain injury, infections in the brain, tumor, stroke. Uh, there are also genetic factors, developmental conditions, and metabolic disturbances, as we talked about earlier. And the causes by frequency vary depending on the age group. Next slide. The seizure triggers include and the number one is missing doses of your anti-epileptic drugs. Um, when you have lack of sleep or you're just having a concurrent illness, such as a common cold, stress, hormonal changes, and for women with menses, illicit drug and alcohol use, especially with withdrawal, and certain medications. Next slide. Now, most seizures for patients with uh, an established diagnosis, they're self-limiting and they're brief, so meaning that they happen for a few minutes and then they stop. But when is it an emergency? I just wanted to mention that if it's a first-time seizure, the first time the patient is ever having a seizure, it is an emergency. And for patients who already have the diagnosis of epilepsy, you want to go to the emergency room not with every seizure, but if your seizure is lasting longer than five minutes or the second seizure occurs without recovery or it's different and longer in duration than your typical seizures, you do want to seek emergent help. Also, if the seizure occurred in water or there is any type of injury, if you're pregnant or diabetic or if the recovery period is unusually long. Next slide. I also wanted to mention a very important topic. It's called Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy, or SUDEP, and it refers to the death of a person with epilepsy without warning and where no cause of death could be found. While the estimated occurrence doesn't seem very high, it's about one death per 1,000 people with epilepsy, it does increase, um, the occurrence does increase for those who have poorly controlled seizures, especially convulsive seizures, so those big generalized tonic-clonic or sometimes called grand mal seizures, the occurrence is higher, it's one death per 100 people. So the best prevention is to have as few seizures as possible, and that means getting better seizure control. So taking your medications on time and as prescribed, as well as if the medications are giving you side effects or it's not working for you, looking into other medications potentially or looking into other treatment options. Next slide. So diagnosing epilepsy includes a few things, having a full uh, detailed medical history, especially your seizure history. So the provider would ask you a lot of detailed questions about your first seizure, what it was like, also getting the history from your family member or caregiver is very important, a neurological examination. Sometimes it'll include blood tests to see if there's potentially an infection or something else that's causing your seizures, an EEG or an electroencephalogram, magnetic resonance imaging or MRI, and computed tomography if you can't have an MRI, and potentially an admission for inpatient video EEG monitoring or the EMU. Next slide. 
So the electroencephalogram, or the EEG, it detects abnormalities in the electrical activity of the brain. So it's reading your brain waves. And as I mentioned earlier, a seizure essentially is an abnormal electrical discharge, which the EEG would catch. And it involves having an EEG technologist placing electrodes, which are flat metal discs, in different positions on your scalp. And a normal EEG tracing does not necessarily mean you don't have an epilepsy diagnosis, especially if you don't have a seizure during the EEG test. And uh, it's an outpatient procedure unless you get admitted for the EMU and you want to avoid caffeine for eight hours before the test. And in some instances, they may ask you to reduce your sleep time before the test. Next slide. Magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, it looks at the structural abnormalities that you can potentially have, and it's a non-invasive procedure. It uses very powerful magnets and constructs pictures of your body, and in our case, pictures of your brain, and it's performed in a specially shielded room. Now, MRI should never be used for patients who have metallic objects in their bodies, and that could include um, things like uh, pacemaker, some pacemakers are more MR compatible right now, but you just want to make sure that you don't have um, things like inner ear implants, aneurysm clips, um, heart valves, stents, or artificial joints that are recently placed, or even bullet fragments. Next slide. Now, the positron emission tomography scan, or the PET scan, is not typically used for all patients in undergoing uh, a diagnosis, but it's usually used for patients who are considering surgery for their seizures. And the PET scan evaluates energy activity of the brain by measuring how the brain is using glucose, oxygen, and other substances. It's performed by injecting a small amount of radioactive substance into the vein, and that substance attaches to glucose. So the picture that comes out is similar to what I have up there on the screen. And for preparation, you want to be fasting the night before for at least six hours. You should take your medications, and they will have you drink water. And it's, like I mentioned, usually obtained for pre-surgical evaluation. Next slide. The Epilepsy Monitoring Unit, or the EMU, is another diagnostic tool, and it's an elective inpatient admission. It's typically a five to seven day stay, includes video EEG monitoring. So it has the EEG, as we talked about earlier, but also video that's continuous and usually watched by a nurse. And the purpose of the EMU admission is to diagnose seizures or another condition. So not everything that looks or sounds like a seizure is a seizure. It can sometimes be a sleeping disorder or even a stress reaction or a migraine headache. And so it's important to get admitted to get the diagnosis if those events are not under control. Another reason is for patients who already have an established diagnosis of epilepsy and are not responding to medications is to evaluate for surgical interventions. And during the admission, it's important to characterize and localize. So the EEG would help us to see what kind of seizure it is and where it's coming from in the brain. And lastly, it could be for medication management. If it's not safe to change a medication as an outpatient, some patients may get admitted to the EMU. And the actual goal of the EMU is to capture the typical seizure events or spells on both video and EEG recording. And in order to do that, sometimes we may utilize triggers to optimize your stay, so achieve that goal, which could include temporarily taking off your seizure medications, uh, doing things like sleep deprivation or flashing lights in the eyes or having you breathe really fast, some breathing exercises to try to achieve that. And an important patient agreement is to remain in the room for the duration of the stay, mainly for safety reasons, because if we are tapering off the medications and trying to see seizures, we do want to have a safe environment, which is why patients get admitted, and also to follow seizure precautions, which include things like having seizure pads and getting regular testing by the nurses and also having an intravenous line on your arm to give you rescue medication if it's needed. Next slide.
I have a list of treatment options for you, which include medications, surgical and stimulation options, and the ketogenic diet. Next slide. So anti-epileptic drug therapy, AED, or basically medications, it's uh, effective in about 60 to 80 percent of persons with epilepsy, and so those seizures can be controlled just with medications alone. And there are many different uh, AEDs available in the market, over 25, and it's typically chosen by considering the age of the patients, what kind of seizures they have, what other medical conditions they may have, and other medical uh, other medications because they can interact. The lifestyle and women of childbearing age also have to consider what kind of medications can be used for them. And the goal of the AED therapy is to have no seizures and no side effects, but often it's about the balance between the two because if it's a very high dose, sometimes you can have a lot of unwanted side effects, but the seizures may be controlled and vice versa. So that's the goal is to have no seizures and no side effects, and 60 to 80% of persons uh, with epilepsy can achieve that. And uh, next talk in October actually will be by a neuropharmacist and going over anti-epileptic drug therapy and medications. Okay, next slide. Epilepsy surgery is now all the service, all the services and treatments that will be discussed from now on is more for patients who do not fit that um, persons who can be controlled by medication. So it's for drug resistant epilepsy. And the goal of epilepsy surgery is to achieve seizure freedom, so controlling the seizures. But that involves a surgery that's aimed at removing a part of the brain that's causing the seizures. Now that doesn't happen immediately as soon as that's identified. It is a long workup, which is called a pre-surgical evaluation, where there are many additional advanced diagnostic tests done to determine if you're eligible for the surgery, if it's safe. And they usually weigh the benefits and the risks. And when the benefits outweigh the risks, the providers may recommend surgery for you. And it's been around for more than a century, but became more utilized in the 1980s and 90s. Next slide. The next three therapies are stimulation therapies. So the goal isn't really um, seizure freedom. Some patients do achieve seizure freedom through these therapies, but for the most part it works like a medication as it lowers your frequency. And vagus nerve stimulation therapy, I have a picture here for you. It's, um, it involves implanting a generator under the skin in your upper chest area on the left side. And there's a lead that's wired to your vagus nerve in the neck. So this is not a brain surgery. And um, it sends stimulation, little impulses uh, set up for every few minutes or however the doctor chooses specifically for you. And then it's an outpatient procedure that usually is just a one day procedure and programmed by the provider and it comes with a magnet that delivers another burst of stimulation if the patient chooses to use that. It has been FDA approved since July 1997, and it's been widely used. Next slide. This is a newer therapy. It's called Responsive Neurostimulation Therapy, or RNS, and it was approved recently uh, in November 2013. It's the only medical device that can monitor and respond to brain activity. It also has a stimulator, neurostimulator, but as you can see, it is in the head and it does involve brain surgery unlike the VNS. The neurostimulator is connected to the leads. You see an example of cortical and depth lead. And those leads are actually placed either on the surface of the brain or deep in the brain where your seizures are identified. So it monitors your seizures and it has the potential of stopping them by sending stimulation to those specific areas. Next slide. There's also deep brain stimulation or DBS. It's currently not FDA approved in the US at this time, but it has been approved and used in Canada and the UK. It's, um, it has been, however, approved for Parkinson's and used since 1987 for quite a long time. And researchers do say that it does uh, prove to, by the studies, at least to reduce seizures. 
and the electrodes are implanted in the anterior nucleus of the thalamus, and again, it's connected to the wires with a neurostimulator in the chest under the skin, just like with the VNS. Next slide. Lastly, there is the ketogenic diet, which is a high-fat, low-carbohydrate, low-protein diet, and it's mainly used in children and it's been studied in children extensively, but adults have been, uh, have been known to use it effectively. It is very critical to maintain and monitor by a specialist and may include being admitted to initiate the diet. Next slide. So that's about it for my talk. I just wanted to provide VA contact numbers in our area. And if you're calling in from other locations, they may differ. But for those who are calling from the greater Los Angeles area, you can refer to these um, if you need. I also wanted to, again, mention that this covers a lot of topics, but we have upcoming talks that will delve more into the topics that were briefly mentioned today. have some resources, so the VA Epilepsy Centers of Excellence website, and then there's a patient education link as well with a lot of education PowerPoint presentations. The Epilepsy Foundation of Greater Los Angeles has a lot of great resources. There's also the SUDEP Institute if you want to learn more about uh, SUDEP and American Epilepsy Society, as well as YouTube videos. It's a link to uh, veterans and epilepsy educational videos that's created by the epilepsy centers, the VA ones, and it has educational talks on different topics as well. Okay.